Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm still an alcoholic. God's Grace, this program is sponsored by Found Necessary to Take a Drink since 2nd of June, 1981, and for that I am truly, truly grateful. Where I come from, we kind of applaud. You know? <laughs> now, for the newcomer, they're not applauding the fact that I've been sober all that long. They're applauding the, they're applauding the fact that Alcoholics Anonymous works in the life of one individual for that long, okay? I'm not taking any credit for that other than I've done what a lot of people do. I showed up, and this stuff happened. See, this thing started around 1935 in June, and it worked so well that when I got here in 81, it could work on me. That's what the deal is. So if you knew an Alcoholics Anonymous and somebody says it's a Friday day, people start clapping, hopefully that's what they're clapping for. Because I heard a speaker say from the podium that uh, congratulating an alcoholic for the time that he's been sober is like congratulating a cowboy with hemorrhoids for staying off his horse. <laughs> It's sort of a necessary deal, you know what I'm saying? So, so, so that's what this is all. I, I figured I'd do that, okay? Thank you, Sheila, for asking me out. Thank you, Warren, for for, May, for doing your service so that it stayed here long enough for me to show up. I appreciate that. Um, thank you, Nick, for driving me all over the place. I'm a difficult passenger. Um, thank you for the show last night. I think it, it, the show was great, but one of the things I loved the most about the whole concept was it takes two angels working shifts to take care of an alcoholic. <laughs> now, that gives a whole new meaning to why we were chosen, okay? <laughs> God has to have something for those angels to do, so he puts two of them on a drunk, and, you know, they're occupied. <laughs> I like that. I like that. I really do. Thanks, Don, so much. I got to see Don about a month ago. We were hanging out at the mountain. I've been to the mountain, and I've been to the canyon. So I'm like, I'm like, I don't know. I'm, I'm like, where's the deserts next? I don't know what the, you know. I'm going everywhere, up and down. And this is truly a bottom for me, okay? <laughs> this is it. I'm in the canyon. I'm, follow, I'm surrounded by red rocks. I don't know. I'm telling you. It's weird. It's really weird. But I'm grateful to be here. I'm glad uh, that I had an opportunity. Um Susan, thank you so much for for kicking us off this morning. I love following an Al-Anon speaker. You get that cry on, and you got it. <laughs> Everybody's emotional. People's nose is all stopped up. And their eyes are red. And just, I'm so happy to be here. It's just great. I love that. I love that. If you are an alcoholic anonymous and you don't attend uh, at least a speaker, at the very least a speaker meeting on a weekend or something like that, that's an Al-Anon speaker, you are missing something about this program. <laughs> Because uh, you need to know, you really need to know what it is, the capacity of somebody who does not have this illness that hangs around us. Because <laughs> we're a long day. <laughs> Chronically self-centered, okay? And there are people who spend most of their lives trying to get us to love them. <laughs> That's wild. That is really crazy. You need a God to live with a drunk. Whether you be the drunk or whether you live with the drunk, you need a God. And this is a, and Al-Anon is one of the best places in the world to find a God so that you can live with a drunk. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous ain't bad either. You know, I'm really grateful for Alcoholics I love the month of June. Man, I, like I said, my birthday's in June. My belly button birthday is the 1st of June. Now, 23 years ago, the 1st of June, I don't remember what I, to this day, I don't remember what I was doing. But the, you know, the 2nd of June is my AA anniversary, and the 10th of June, of course, is the birthday of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I love the month of June. The month of June is a great time for rebirth and renewal. In the summertime, it gets hot. Everybody gets excited about the things to come and planning vacations. And I mean, all kinds of stuff starts happening. And, of course, you know, if you're an alcoholic like me, you're into June like around January. <laughs> you know, but you got to do that time. And I'm, I'm real grateful that I had a chance to come out here and start, you know, celebrate the first weekend of my, my anniversary, my 23rd anniversary with you all. Um, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. I, I give you greetings from the Foxhall Group in Bellevue, Yay. Nebraska, you know. Yay. So there are some spies in the, in the audience that are from my home group, so i got to tell the truth. 
you know, because they'll go back and report, you know. But uh, I wish I wish bid you greeting. If you come on Tuesday nights, 36th and you, we'll be there from 7 to about 9, 9.30. We have a good meeting. B- a bunch of us kind of get together and try to carry the message. I think we do a pretty good job because a lot of us. Alcoholics are like roaches. They're everywhere. <laughs> They're everywhere, They're everywhere. The sober ones are a lot more fun. Let me just—that's my, my opinion. That's purely my opinion. Now, my full name is Sterling David III. Ain't that something? <laughs> now, when you got a Roman numeral at the end of your name, you're supposed to get a country to run. <laughs> that pretty much defines my childhood. I was waiting for my country. I had learned in history, Charles I, Louis the Thirteenth, Sterling the Third. I should be king of the Bahamas or something. <laughs> what I got at seven was a little sister that moved into my room, so it pissed me off. <laughs> I am one of those. I am. I'm. I'm. I'm crazy. I'm just not wrapped too tight. I ain't never been wrapped all that tight. Um, and the thing is, from the time I can remember thinking, I ain't been wrapped too tight. Because my thinking comes. I don't know. I don't know about you, but for me, the day starts with what about me? And what am I going to get mine? And what about me? And then mine. And then me. And then me, 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 me. And the song is starting. The first time, I, I haven't even taken a breath hardly. I mean, the, the, the day has started that way. And it's interrupted today with thoughts of you. <laughs> That's it. That's my whole thing. You know what I mean? And that was the way I started on the planet. Except, you know, I didn't have this program. So it was always about me. Do they love me? How much do they love me? Are they willing to tell me that they love me? And if they tell me they love me, are they lying? And if they're lying, how much are they lying? Do I really, really lying, or are they just sort of lying? I mean, you know, I, that's the way my brain works. Mm, you know, that's that song that was going on in my head. So I was screwed up from the word go. You know, and the thing is, I don't know. I know I'm the type of kid that needed sponsorship in kindergarten. <laughs> I mean, you know, because there was two groups in that room when I was five years old, six years old, me and all of them. <laughs> And it would have been nice to be able to drop a dime in the, in the phone and then call somebody and say, what do I do, what do I do? And they'd say, eat the cookie, take the nap, you know? <laughs> That's all you got to do. <laughs> you know? Got a problem with figure painting, give me a call, you know? <laughs> That's all you got to do. But I have problems with that kind of stuff. I don't follow instructions well. I, I'm not one of those that, you know, because I think. I think. I think, 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 think. <laughs> I'm always thinking. You know, and that's what made it so difficult for me to live life on life's terms early on. Because I was chronically self-centered, consumed in myself, trying to figure out what I was about and who I am and whether you like me and whether I like you and all that good stuff like that. And I'm thinking all the time. That's a long day for a six, seven-year-old. You know, I mean, and that was just the way it was for me. Now, I, you know, you can look at me and tell that, you know, in, well, I grew up in New York. I was born in Whiteman Air Force Base, but I grew up in New York City, in Harlem and in the South Bronx. And I used to always think, you know, as a kid, I, I watched a lot of TV. I mean, Donna Reed and, and, and you know, uh, Leave it to Beaver and, and all of those shows. And on those shows, they always had that split-level A-framed house, you know, and the manicured lawn, and she always was in the, with the apron on, baking cookies, hair's always done, he comes home at five, throws the briefcase, honey, I'm home, they, you know, if Junior screwed up, they fixed it in a half an hour. <laughs> you know, everything was wonderful. And, you know, I grew up in the South Bronx in the projects. We lived on the 18th floor. There was no lawn. <laughs> you know, the paper never landed on the porch because there was no porch. <laughs> You know, and and you know, we didn't. You can look at me and tell mom wasn't don't Donna Reed, okay? <laughs> and, and we never solved any problem that had anything to do with me in a half an hour. I can tell you that. <laughs> so I often thought as a kid that you know, if I had had that leave it to Beaver kind of lifestyle, I'd be all right. I'd have been better. But I've gone to thousands of meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, thousands. And I've sat next to people that had that that lifestyle, straight up. And they're just as screwed up as I am, so it doesn't really make any difference. I'm an alcoholic. I'm not an alcoholic because of bad toilet training. I'm not an alcoholic because of a, of a dysfunctional family. My family is functional as hell until I get in it and try to manage them. They just, <laughs> that is the only problem my family has is me. Because they God's kids and they're just doing the best they can. So it's not the dysfunctional home that made me an alcoholic. It is not none of that stuff. It is the fact that I am, I have an allergy of the body, 
and an obsession of the mind. I had the obsession of the mind before I ever knew about the allergy of the body. I brought this insanity to Alcoholics Anonymous. I quit drinking and I brought this insanity to Alcoholics Anonymous. We, we call it old ideas. That's what I brought with me. A lot of old ideas. And I had to let them go absolutely. And the, 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 the comfort level that I have been in Alcoholics Anonymous at, whether it's been high or low, is directly proportional to the amount I'm willing to give up. If I'm willing to give up a lot of these old ideas and embrace these new ones, I'm a lot more comfortable in Alcoholics Anonymous. But if I'm not, it's a long day. Because y'all make me mad. <laughs> Piss me off. You remind me of things that I'm just unwilling to do. And it's, it's a level of willingness. Now, I didn't know that as a kid. You know, and puberty's tough enough for the average child. But, you know, you had a self-centered, chronic, you know, involved and in my own head alcoholic. And you got to, it's a hard deal. Thank God for a talk and a Code 45. You know, for you it was Old English 800, for me it was a tall can of Coke 45 on a summer's day in the South Bronx. And, you know, at 13 years old. And when I knocked that back, magic took place. Uh-oh, something died. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff falling off. Ooh. You know, magic took place for me. I mean, I felt like I could speak as well as Jesse Jackson, play sports as well as Reggie Jackson, dance as well as Michael Jackson. <laughs> That's the way I felt on the inside when I took that tall can of Coke 45 down. It changed my perception of my life. Now, whether I could do those things that well or not didn't matter. I felt like I could. And if you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, you're new here to the program, and you're wondering, you know, what differentiates an alcoholic from anybody else. I, For me, anyway, when the alcohol stopped working, I couldn't stop working it. It had become my solution at 13, and it remained that way. For a long, long, long time. And sometimes, even today, it's still that way. It still works that way for me, even today. I will think that it's a solution in my head, you know, and it's not. It hurt me. It hurt me. It turned on me. And I still think that it's possible. Well, maybe if I just have one. Now, I don't know if any of y'all, you know, but I think, like, sometimes, you know, those call, you know the, the, the football game's on and that Budweiser commercial comes and they pour that long stream of beer into that cold glass and that foam comes up to the top and then that little, one little line that just runs right down the side. Don't that just get you? Don't it get you? It's hot out here. I know I got somebody. <laughs> I know I got somebody thirsty. You lock all the cars. <laughs> Watch them golf carts. <laughs> Somebody's gonna head out. I tell you, because man, that look. I think about it today. I mean, but the fact of the matter is, I thought it through, just like Don. You know, just like Susan. We we know from where we come. You know, and that's the deal. I know from where I come. High school looked like a pretty good deal. You know, I was, I was a full-blown alcoholic by the time I was in high school. It didn't really, it, it didn't look like it to most people. I mean, I grew up, like I said, in the South Bronx. Mom was a, a narcotics officer. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Made me real popular in the neighborhood, let me tell you. <laughs> now, she wasn't one of those that was out in the street. She was at a facility, but jet and still. I mean, I got a lot of information about alcohol. I did. I got a lot of information about alcohol. I got a lot of information about drugs. Got a lot of information about drugs. And some of my friends were into recreational chemicals, and some of my friends were into stuff, all kinds of stuff. And not, my neighborhood wasn't the best, and it wasn't the worst. It was just the neighborhood, you know. So I attracted to all the negative elements, and I hung out into those things. And, and that was what really developed my disease. The disease that I suffer from is alcoholism. Okay, I ingested alcohol, and I felt like I could handle things, and I could deal with stuff. Some of my friends used other things, and they couldn't because it incapacitated them. So I felt better then because I could have a couple of rum and cokes and I knew what to do in a situation and I knew how to handle it and I felt better then. Now, isn't that something? I'm drinking something that's anesthetizing and inebriating me and I feel better then. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's I think, a thing that makes me an alcoholic. I think that that stuff is going to make me feel better then because secretly I think I'm less than. And somehow or another I'm going to get the great, e great equalization if I just ingest this stuff so that I cannot be afraid of you. You find out what's wrong with me, you won't love me. And I really need to love you. I really need for you to love me. I'm not sure I like you. <laughs> but I really need for you to love me. Because if you love me, then you can't leave me. And you can't judge me. And I'm very much afraid of being judged or left. 
That's the deal. So alcohol was essential in my living life on life's terms by the time I'm in high school. You know, and, you know, I had proven that I could do it to the level of blackout. I had blacked out a few times. I at one party. I was very embarrassed. We bl I blacked out at this party trying to impress this young lady that I was dating and and was drinking gin all that night. And you know, do what you do best to impress the girl you love, you know. And so I uh, <laughs> I passed out and we woke up that morning and I blamed the whole thing on bad onion dip. You know, I mean, <laughs> it had to be that onion dip. Couldn't possibly be the gin I was drinking. You know, and I don't know if any one of us has ever ended up at a halfway house or in a treatment center for having an allergic reaction to strawberries. So, you know, I just don't think that's happening for us. You know, it was ethyl alcohol that got me to that place. And it was that it was established very early on. But, but people in my family just didn't seem to think that I was an alcoholic because this was the 70s and um, early 60s and 70s. And, and the deal is I just I didn't look like an alcoholic. They looked like the ones in the Bowery that had the long overcoat on and the, the paper bag. Those people would, would have recognized recognized as an alcoholic, but a 13-year-old young, talented young man, they just didn't think it was going to happen. My mother and father spent a lot of money to try to give me a good education. You know, I'm, I'm the product of uh, Catholic school education all the way up to my first year of college. And I really don't have a problem with the Catholic doctrine. I think it's a sound, wonderful religion for many people, and it, it, it provides great solace to those who, you know, have to live life on life's terms, just like us. And uh, the only thing about it, I just had to have some of the nuns I ran into were wrapped too tight, other than, you know, but... <laughs> But then again, they had to deal with me. And in the book, we like to call ourselves precocious, which I feel is just a nice way of saying asshole. Because um, <laughs> I asked this woman in his first grade, you know, I raised my hand on summer's day in New York and Harlem and asked her, you know, sister, how can you have a virgin birth? And she was not prepared to discuss that profound theological concept with an eight-year-old. <laughs> so she hit me and sent me to the principal. And when I sat in there and waited for the principal to come and hit me some more, I discovered, to, in my way of thinking, that the grown-ups just don't always have all the answers. Now, I'm chronically self-centered, very fearful, and I just discovered what was going to be the secret I brought into Alcoholics Anonymous. I ain't got to listen to you. I ain't got to listen to what you say. What I think is more important than what you say. And if, thank God, thank God that Alcoholics Anonymous is about action. Because if I had come in here with that thinking and all you was doing was talking to me, I probably would have died. But see, you did stuff. See, Alcoholics Anonymous is always about action. We walk up to folks and we shake their hand. We give them a phone number. We got lists of stuff for them to do. And if you happen to run into an alcoholic and Al-Anon meeting together, you're going to get managed from the time you walk in <laughs> to the time your butt walks out. Because <laughs> they know how to do it, Jack. <laughs> So that was the deal. Thank God it's actions that got me in here. And it was certainly actions that got me to the point where I needed you. I drank. I'm a drinker. I like alcohol. I mean, I drank. It, it worked for me. And by the time I was, I was out of high school, I was a full-blown drunk. It didn't look like me, that I was most likely to become an alcoholic. That's, you didn't see that under my, my picture on the, in, in the yearbook, but it was, it was established. And the deal was I always wanted to be, I wanted to be a gang member. I always wanted to feel a part of something. I always wanted to be a gang member. I grew up in the South Bronx, and a lot of my friends were in the gangs. But because I went to these really good schools, they, they realized that they, I had a chance of getting out of that neighborhood, so many of those guys that were involved in the gangs would make it known that nobody could recruit me into any of the gangs because I had an opportunity. I might get out of there. That was kind of interesting back in the old days when gangs were about society that if anybody had a chance to get out of the neighborhood, they made sure they kept them as far away from danger and destruction as they possibly could. Now, I embraced danger and destruction because that's what I wanted. So it isn't a problem. My, my neighborhood is not the reason why I'm an alcoholic. It is not the reason why I, could, I, I failed in life. I am. You know, because there was people all through my life, I can remember, like Don was talking about, like Susie was talking about, all through my life, there have been people that have had a spiritual awakening of some sort or another and have carried this message to me that, that God loves you and so do I, and I'm trying, I'm here to help you. My fourth grade teacher was that way. I can remember a couple of those priests and some of those nuns that weren't doing in, completely insane. They were trying to help me. I know there were people in my family that were trying to help me. I am standing before you as a direct result of a lot of prayers that were said by people I don't even know. That's what's here. That's what's standing before you is the culmination of a lot of people really wanting the best for me and for mankind in general. 
And that's how that's what got me to the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous because I ain't cure cancer to get here. I hurt folks. I hurt. I stole. It's hard to have relationships when you're an alcoholic because if you got if you're gonna be an alcoholic, you gotta learn how to lie. <laughs> and lying really keep, makes it difficult to have a relationship with somebody because at some point in time you're gonna either have to fess up. <laughs> What's the likelihood of that? You know? <laughs> or you're going to get away from them. And you know which one I choose. I get away from them. So it's hard to keep a relationship going with a sister and, and mother and father and friends and family. So joining the Air Force was a perfect thing for me to do to escape. I was going to join a big gang, which was the Department of Defense. I mean, you know, hey. <laughs> they wore colors and they had nuclear weapons, you know? Mm. <laughs> Now, when I raised my right hand and joined the United States Air Force, they didn't think they were getting an up-and-coming young alcoholic. They thought they were getting a relatively intelligent young man who was going to train and pay and send somewhere. I didn't know I was an alcoholic. Nobody knew. So, And, and, and I've heard many uh, a GI talk about how the military enabled their drinking. I, it, did, it wasn't the case with me. It wasn't. They didn't wrestle me to the ground and pour Jack Daniels down my throat the day I enlisted. But they did have on every installation that I was stationed at, they had a bar. But they also had a church, and they had an education center, and they had the Boy Scouts, and they had a detachment of the ham radio club, and they had all this other stuff. But you know what I attracted to? That bar was where I went, because I liked it there. That was my fantasy island. I could be whatever I wanted to be. And the Air Force, all they did was provide me with the necessary income, because you got to have, if you're going to do alcoholism, you got to have an income. You gotta have a place to crash and at least three three meals a day in the beginning. Now, the income doesn't necessarily have to be yours. And the place you stay don't necessarily have to be yours. And towards the end, eating ain't all that big a deal, no way. But that's what you need in order to develop your alcoholism, and that's what the military provided me. Heck, I could have been a postal worker and done the same thing. So it wasn't the military that made me an alcoholic. It was the fact that I liked alcohol and the military gave me money. So my alcoholism bloomed. They sent me out to California and I drank too much. I got in trouble. Of course, when you drink all the time, you're going to get in trouble. Because it's real hard. There are very few people on the planet that are alcoholic as we are that can maintain a stable, serene life. And if you know any of them, you know, keep their name and number. Because <laughs> the numbers are dwindling, I tell you, because it's real hard to do that. It's just going to take away everything. Alcohol is a rapacious creditor. It takes it all. Everything, everything, everything. All your self-respect, all your money, all your, your hopes, your dreams, all of that. It's got to go. Got to go. Alcohol wants it all. And see, I was well on my road to, to, to giving it everything. But I was getting in trouble. And, you know, I'm thinking, I'm always thinking, 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 thinking. <laughs> So I'm in trouble. I said, oh, yeah, I know it. I know I need to, to, to kind of calm down and domesticate myself. Now, I'm chronically self-centered. I'm living in fear. I'm drinking all the time. What a chronically self-centered person needs is a relationship. <laughs> Somebody to help me love me. <laughs> now, if you're an alcoholic, you don't date. Alcoholics don't date. We hunt down and we capture. <laughs> Most people, when they encounter us, sense the danger, and they run. al don't run all that fast. They just try to slowly trot, so we overtake them. Now I'm finding out they planned that from the beginning. That's why we together. We're some crazy people. I, lo I love it. In recovery, it's fun. But out there in the world, it's insane. It really is. Our, our, our dynamic is crazy. But I found the object of my obsession. And I was relentless in pursuing her. And I promised her the world. I promised I, I wanted to be a, a good husband and a good, good father and a, uh, a, you know, a good member in the military. And I wanted to be a good man. I really did. I wanted to be all of those things. I was sincere. If you had asked me the question... Even from waking up from a hangover on Sunday morning, if you had asked me the question, does, Sterling, do you want to be a good man and a good husband and a good father, I would have answered yes, and that, that needle would not have wavered one iota. I just didn't have the tools. I didn't know how to go about doing it. And when I promised her the world, I meant it, but I had alcoholism, and there was no way that we were going to have a happy life because of my alcoholism. There's just no way. Because I was drinking, and every time I had a disappointment or a success or a failure in my life, I drank. 
And every time we had a problem, I drank. And every time we had a good thing happen, I drank. On the 5th of March, 1980, I was blessed with a little girl that was born in northern Japan, and I drank. You know, because I was celebrating. I always wanted to have fun. Always wanted to have fun. And in Alcoholics Anonymous, I've learned how to celebrate. Because when you celebrate, something has had to have occurred. So when I was looking for fun, I was always trying to make stuff happen. And it was never happening the way I wanted to have it. I was never having my fun. But in Alcoholics Anonymous, I've learned how to celebrate. I've learned how to celebrate for other folks. The best fun I have is when I'm celebrating for somebody else. You know, I like to have things happen, good things happen to me. But, man, it's a warm fuzzy I get when somebody else has got something good happening for them. That's amazing. I didn't plan on that when I came here. All I wanted to do was get out of trouble. That's all I was here for, is get out of trouble. You know, now that daughter is born. I'm a dad. My wife is out of the service now, so I'm the breadwinner and I'm responsible. And, you know, in northern Japan, they drive on the wrong side of the road. And I'd get so drunk sometimes, I forget which side of the road I was supposed to be on. So I'd drive down the middle. And that kind of bizarre behavior worries folks. So they want to fix me because, you know, they, they think I'm salvageable, but they, they just don't know what to do because we do bizarre stuff when we drink. And the people who don't have a problem with drinking wonder why we do the bizarre stuff. They ask us, why do you do that? <laughs> and you know what we usually say? Oh. <laughs> it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> And, you know, and we come in here and you, you people, we tell people what we've done and we all go, yeah, I would have done the same thing, you know. I mean? <laughs> so if you're wondering if you're an alcoholic, if you just share with somebody some bizarre thing that you did and they, their eyebrow doesn't go up, you're in the right place because they probably did it, you know. That's the deal. Yeah, I would, but the military decided they were going to send me to this program. For six weeks, I had to put down the alcohol and go to group. And some of us have been to group. You know what group's like. You, know, you sit around group one another. Now, here I am. I've been drinking for a little while re regularly. And uh, now from Monday through Friday, I'm supposed to not drink and go to group. So you know I was happy to be around. You know, just a joy, spreading warmth and sunshine everywhere I went. <laughs> not drinking. I'd go into that club Friday to get some of that funny money that you know, the Japanese like to spend, and I was going to go take my family out to dinner. And I was going to, you know, do this. Not going there to see my best friends. You know, these guys in these bars, I spent a lot of money making these guys my best friends. I'm in my mid-twenties, you know? And, and I'd go in there and have a Coke, and they'd be sitting around drinking beers and talking trash, and I'd have another Coke, and they'd be sitting around talking about Vietnam, and I'd have rum and Coke, and, and I'd start talking about Vietnam, and I joined in 77. It was over. And about 3 o'clock in the morning, I'd wake, I'd come to, I, I remember one time I came uh, to, to a, a, next to a rather large uh, oriental gentleman singing New York, New York. <laughs> and I had to be at work in about two hours, and I had no idea what part of the country in Japan I was in. I knew, no, had no idea where my car was or anything like that. So quite naturally, they realized they were going to have to intensify my treatment. So you're going to send me to uh, the Philippines. Now, I don't know if any people are ex-military here, but um, the Philippines is a tough place to get sober. You know, beer at that time was a nickel. <laughs> you could go outside the gate and explore every demented fantasy you ever had with $10, come home with change and a few diseases. <laughs> this is where they decided they were going to send me to get treatment. <laughs> So they carted my butt off, and I've, at 35, 40 days, they taught me everything you can possibly learn about alcoholism that you can put in one brain, they put in my brain. You know, they taught me every Father Martin movie I ever saw, I saw in treatment. <laughs> I saw I'll Quit Tomorrow, Days of Wine and Roses. I saw the Jelly Net Chart of Recovery and Sobriety and Drunkenness. I saw all that stuff. I saw pictures of cirrhotic livers. Oh, it was awful. I felt so sorry for you people. <laughs> I was willing to make a donation. <laughs> Y'all were a sorry, sorry lot, I tell you. I didn't take it personal. Couldn't possibly be. Now, we had a vote uh, a couple of days before we graduated from alcohol education. Who was most likely to drink six months? And if I had a vote, it was 12 of us, 12 angry men, I like to call us. <laughs> if, it, if I had a vote, it would have been a landslide victory for yours truly. Because I was not convinced I was an alcoholic. I came back to the base that I was at, and I was in trouble. And I always say that I didn't, I didn't come to Alcoholics Anonymous because I saw the light. I felt the heat. I was in trouble. Now, there was people, you talked about it last night, trouble. There are people in trouble. 
And that's how we get most folks to come in Alcoholics Anonymous. Nobody's going to come in here on a winning streak. <laughs> you know, I just inherited a million dollars, and my wife and I are fine, and I've got a great job, and I love my higher power, and I just thought I'd come in to see what an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting was like. <laughs> no, not going to happen. People come in here with that little three-by-five card, and it's all the judges or the cops or their wives or whatever's fault. You know, and they ain't happy to be here, and they ain't happy to see us, and that's why I, I smile so much when I see them walk in the door, because I know, I know exactly what they feel like. I walked in, and you know, I hope your experience in walking in the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous was like mine, but sometimes it isn't. You know, we have to do something about that. But I walked in, and I saw these people, and their smile went from ear to ear. You know, they're like, hi. My name's so and so. We're about to start the meet. My name this is so and so and this is so and so. Here, have a seat. We're gonna start the meet. You know? I got this little card, and I'm not. She's not happy. The wife is not happy. She's about to leave me. The Air Force is watching over me. I feel oppressed. And the last thing I need is a bunch of happy, non-drinking nutcases ministering to me. That's what I thought was going on. Because y'all were just too damn happy to not be drinking. I thought you were on drugs. I was convinced you were on drugs. Because you couldn't be that damn happy and not be drinking. And they started the meeting. And they started the meeting. They started with prayer. They ended with prayer. And they passed the basket. And that's when I discovered what this was. I, I know what this is. This is a cult. Okay, I got it. See, because I went through Catholic school education to my first year of college. I'd also I'd left Catholicism very early in my, my young career and it, uh, pursued Islam for a while. I also practiced an African religion called Yoruba. You know, so I knew a lot about God. I had the Book of Mormon. I had the Bible. I had the Quran. You know, I was one of those kind of people in my underwear with a 36 bottle of, of Code 45, have an argument with a Jehovah's Witness and win. <laughs> <laughs> they would leave. Okay? <laughs> so I knew all about God. So I was waiting for you to put that hard sell on me, see, because I knew pretty soon you had some missionary work in Africa you were going to do or a building you needed to build or something. So I was waiting for that, that, that you were going to hit me for the donation, and you never did. You know, that's the deal. You never put that lean on me. Because what you were doing, even though God was here, what you were doing was you were sharing your experience, strength, your experience, strength, and hope with me. And you were doing stuff. You're making coffee and you're doing that and you're and you laughing. I mean, I listened to guys tell some horrendous stuff in that first meeting and people would just laugh, you know? <laughs> guys, I hit a pole 17 times and you know, puking blood and uh, just, you know, I, I fell asleep in a ditch, you know, and everybody's going, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> and I'm embarrassed for you. I mean, like, it's like, you can't tell that kind of stuff in public. What's wrong with you? <laughs> You know, but I would come at it with something strangely attractive about you all. Now, I had been to a lot of groups, and I'd been to a lot of churches. I'd been dunked a couple of times. And I, I mean, one time I was, um, I was, I was pursuing this young lady because I wanted what she had, and I was willing to go to any length to get it. <laughs> and she was a member of this, this Baptist choir, so I joined the Baptist choir. And... Uh, they got loaned out to a Methodist church, you know, so I was in the Baptist choir, and on any given Sunday, I'd be a you know, failed Catholic, practicing Muslim with a hangover, singing in a Baptist choir at a Methodist church, you know, so <laughs> that was the deal. So, I, you know, I was just waiting for this stuff to happen. I was waiting for this thing, but I didn't have, you know, I knew about God. I had this relationship. I was always seeking this relationship. I was always seeking a religion that would allow me to be a complete asshole and still get into heaven <laughs> and couldn't find it. But I met you all, and, and that was the thing you were doing. You were doing stuff. You had, you had practical solutions to sp the spiritual problems I had. And all you were asking me to do was put the plug in the jug one day at a time and hang out with you. And I met some real characters. In my, my first home group, there were a lot of characters. There was a big guy named George. George liked hugging folks. And, you know, I'm from New York. You know the man. You ain't hugging me. I'm sorry. Just ain't happening. You know, and George would chase me around a little room to hug me. And one day he caught me, and I got hugged. And, and I really liked the hug. I started going to meetings just for the hugs. So now I think I'm like three, four months old, and I think I'm gay, you know? <laughs> Something wrong. You shouldn't be liking a guy hugging you this much. <laughs> now, if you knew an alcoholic's numbers, I know you got insane things on your mind. Share them with somebody. 
Because, you know, especially old timers, they ain't got much to do. <laughs> Just tell them, think, well, stuff that's on your mind, if nothing else, it'll make them giggle, you know? <laughs> because you can get some help that way. If I had talked to somebody, they would have explained things, and you can't possibly be gay. Well, you know, I, I, that way you wanted to go out and buy a dress and start, you know. Because <laughs> that's the kind of stuff I start thinking, 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 thinking. And give me something wrong to think. I'm going everywhere with it, you know? And that's what's so great about sponsorship is that, you know, he interrupts that thinking with the truth, which will really bum you out if you're really on a good think. <laughs> Nothing will screw up a good think more than the truth, especially if it's about you. You know, that, and my sponsor's really good at that. But I was, oh, that first year I was in love with Alcoholics Anonymous, and of course they suck me in. An AA group is cunning, baffling, and powerful. They will make you do stuff you don't want to do. So they walked up to me and he said, Stanley, we need your help. Sure, there's no problem. I'd love to help you people. <laughs> what can I do for you? He said, uh, we need a coffee maker. So I said, okay, you know, so they gave me the key. I got the key. I got the key. Drunks might drink if I don't make the coffee. So I'm getting there two hours early for a 20-minute commitment, <laughs> making coffee. Now, I don't know how to make coffee. I make bad coffee. To this day, I make bad coffee. I make bad coffee. And I did not know. I'm not going to ask anybody, of course. You know, why should I ask anybody? You know, so I look at those big t t tubs we do, and I figured there's about 12, 14 people come to the meeting. 12, 14 little yellow caps should work. See, there's ex-coffee makers in the room. I know that. I was making espresso. I wasn't making coffee. But they drank it for two weeks. Used a lot of cream. People, people's eyes were blinking when they were saying <laughs> But they thanked me for my service work. We got the circle, and they said we need another coffee maker. Three people volunteered. <laughs> Thank you, Sterling. Keep coming back. <laughs> you know, I stole my first big book. I've been giving big books away since for a long time, trying to make up for that. I knew it. And now it took me. I was five years old before I realized they knew. <laughs> we were northern Japan. Big books ain't growing on trees out there. They had to order them from GSO. So they knew how many they had. If one was missing, and they all had one, hmm, <laughs> I wonder where it could be. <laughs> you know, so they tricked me into reading it because they tell me stuff was on the wrong page numbers. I say, oh, yeah, that's on page uh, 448. I'm reading 448, 449, 450, 451. No, it wasn't. It was on 449. Oh, sorry, you know. <laughs> they do all kinds of stuff like that. So, you know, and, and then they asked me, to, I figured, they, they asked me to chair the meeting. I thought it was because I was so eloquent, you know, just <laughs> so articulate and cool and suave. And they just knew I was a nut. And if I was at the front of the room, they could spend the rest of the time 12-stepping me. See, because I would start the meeting off with whatever was going on in my head. And then they would just fix it. You know, they'd go around the room and hit me. And I loved Alcoholics Anonymous after that first year. There was just the one small problem with AA as far as I was concerned. You know, because when I came in the room of Alcoholics Anonymous, I saw these pictures. This picture of these two old white guys. <laughs> okay, you know. And another picture of these three white guys, one on the bed. I was like, okay, all right. And throughout that year, you know, it had been a, kind of a small meeting, so I was like fresh meat most of that year. So I was getting a lot of hip. And uh, and just wasn't enough African Americans in Alcoholics Anonymous as far as I was concerned. You know, I just thought that was just one minor problem. Well, there was a couple of problems. I was going to rewrite the book later, but first things first. Um, I need to get more African Americans in Alcoholics Anonymous. So I took it upon myself. I was going to dedicate my life to getting black folks in AA. It was going to be thousands of them. You know, because I was going to put another picture up on that wall. <laughs> this is AA the next generation, Jack. <laughs> We're going to fix this program. And I came back to the States, and I went to a meeting in, in D.C. where there were, it seemed like thousands of black folks in Alcoholics Anonymous. Many of them sober longer than me. It pissed me off. You know, I had about a year sober. <laughs> I'd like to tell you that my, my, my sobriety was stellar the first from the very beginning, but it wasn't. I, for about five years, I didn't have a, a sponsor. I did a, a fourth, a fifth step at two and did it with a priest because I know that's if they spill about anything on that, they'd go to the hot place. So I figured I was, I was safe there, you know, and it worked because I stuck around. But I had a second pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization at five years sober. I was either going to kill myself or get a sponsor. Equally tragic decisions, as far as I was concerned. <laughs> my God has a sense of humor. I don't know about your higher power, but my God has a sense of humor. Sent me to Omaha, Nebraska. Now, that does not sound like AA Mecca. 
you know, <laughs> Cleveland, maybe New York, okay, but Omaha, come on. So I go to this little meeting downstairs in, in the bottom of a Catholic church, and I come down the stairs and I meet these people that are, hi, how you doing? My name is so-and-so. We have to start the meeting. This is Alcoholics Diamonds. <laughs> Pissed me off. Pissed me off. Because I'm five years sober. I'm serious. You know, and it wasn't nothing funny. And these people were having way too much fun. But it was something about them that attracted me. Again, it's always about what you do. It's not always what you say. What you do speaks so loud, I can't hear what you say. And one of the things that we are about doing is we about take, we take actions that are loving. To us, they're a pain in the butt. They're sponsor directed most of the time. But what they are is loving. And what that person that walks in the door that's broken sees is or feels is the love and the acceptance and the tolerance that exists in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's what's attractive. Because we're all chronically self-centered and would, you know, just don't care 99% of the time. And together what we do is something so wonderful and so powerful that it is very compelling to people that are broken on the inside or that are lonely on the inside or that hate or that are angry, that they just stick around. And it's our job to make sure that that stays perfect, that, that they always see that, that the smiles that we give them are the ones that we have to give and that they're free and that they're for you and you alone. Right now, I love you. You know, that's what I was, a, that's what I was attracted to. And of course, there were nutcases in there that made, that entertained me. You know, there was this one guy that had bright red hair, white shirt. I thought he was from the, like, the mental ward because he was just so enthusiastic. Yeah! yeah! You know, he was just so enthusiastic. It just, I thought there was something wrong with him. He just had to be. It took me a couple of weeks before I found out he'd been sober longer than me. It really worried me then, you know? <laughs> He's still a sober member of my home group today, you know, and, and one, of the, one of my heroes. But I found a man that walked up to me with a meeting schedule, and he circled some meetings, and he looked at me, and he said, if you don't want to hide in Alcoholics Anonymous, go to these meetings. And that pissed me off. How dare you? There's 500 meetings in this town. I can go to any meeting I want to. I took his inventory that day. I took his inventory the next day. I took his inventory the day after. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little clue. If... You've had somebody in your head for three straight days, the same sex as you, and you don't have a sponsor? Get them for a sponsor. Because <laughs> they're going to spend that much time up in your head, at least they can clean some stuff up while they're up there. <laughs> so I asked Reggie to sponsor me. He made me say, please piss me off. <laughs> he immediately started telling me things to do, and they made absolutely no sense. There were times I'd call him after having an argument with her. See, because I had an al -Anon, and she wasn't going to Al-Anon meetings. I had enough literature in my house to start my own meeting. So I was trying to fix her, because in my mind, if I fixed her, I'd be okay. Isn't that crazy? Fix her, I'd be okay. And I was just, and I, we'd have these arguments, and she, and I, I'd call him, and I'd go, oh, all right, now this is what she said, and that's what she means, and, and this is what I said, and you know I was saying this, and you know I'm right, and she's wrong, and yada, 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 and he would go, go mow the lawn. <laughs> and hang up. And I'm wondering, does this man have any clues of what's going on in my life? What is wrong with him? I'm asking him for help. And he's telling me to go do the lawn. Because Reggie knew that I had an I'm allergic to grass. Fresh cut grass makes, makes my sinuses act up. And what I could do, after I mowed the lawn, the only thing I could do is take a couple of aspirin and lay down. I can't fight. There'd be peace in my house because I didn't have to I didn't know that washing the dishes was a spiritual axiom. I had no idea. He would say, if you're going to go to these weekend things, what you're supposed to do is when you get home is do something nice for the family because they have gone without you for this weekend and it's just right for you to pay back. You know, and I'd say, why? I don't, you know, but I would do it. And what gradually started happening is the actions that he suggested in my life started to take root and change my environment. Now, we ended up with a divorce. At 10 years of sobriety, I went up the stairs one day and asked her that all-important question. You should never ask somebody if you're not prepared for the answer. I asked her, do you want to be with me? And she said no. You know, and she wanted, she took my daughter of seven years, and they went back to the East Coast. And I was mortified. I was destroyed from the inside. I mean, I was destroyed, destroyed. 
I felt like a failure as a man again. I felt like a failure as a father. All the things would come crashing down. You know how we do pain and you know how we do guilt. We just walk around with it like it's a shroud. And somebody comes up to you and says, what's the matter? Nothing. And you get in the car and go, how come nobody wants to talk to me? You know, I mean, it's crazy. Thank God my sponsor had the sense of mind to walk up to me and go, you know, we're really blessed to have the only man ever to get a divorce in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> Cruel. Cruel. <laughs> it's terrible. The truth. They will always catch you at your lowest point when, you're ter when you feel the worst about yourself and tell you the truth. And then walk away. <laughs> I, it was amazing. But he was absolutely right. I, did, I, let, I had to let her go, and I had to do an inventory about what kind of man I am in a relationship, and I had to vow to not do that again or to be that way again. And God, with his sense of humor, put another person in my life almost immediately, a woman that I got a chance to do it differently with. You know, I, I told her the truth from the word go, and I, I laid it out. I told her I was damaged goods, and this is what I do, and this is how I do it, and these are the people I hang out with. And it, it, be, it grew into a relationship. I was developing that relationship with her, and I was developing a relationship with my daughter, whom I didn't always treat well. I remember one time, she, she, she oh, man, she, she messed me up. Tuesday night, she wanted me to stay home and play with her. All she wanted me to do was stay home and play with her. And I had to go to that meeting. I had to go to that meeting. I had to go to that meeting. It's my home group. I got to go. I'll see you later, sweetheart, but I got to go. I was pounding that steering wheel all the way to the meeting, but I had to go. And there were some times, man, when I really, really did not pay much attention to my daughter. As much as I loved her, I just didn't have the time or the, the focus or the, the mental or the whatever I needed. At that point, I just didn't have it. And now she was gone, and I felt bad about that. And she would call, or I would call her, and we would get on the phone, and we would talk, and there were things that were going on in her life that I was missing. I was missing it. And I would tell them, I'm Reggie, and I would call and complain and whine, and he would say, you're not going to be just a checkbook dad. You send the cards, you send the letters, you make the phone calls, you do the best you can. You be the best dad you can be over the phone. That's all you got. That's what you're going to have to do. And I would hang that phone up, and I'd feel like crap. And sometimes at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'd wake up in the morning, and I'd say to you, so you're a rotten father. But I was doing that relationship with her, and I was sponsoring guys, and I was working a job, and I was doing this stuff. I was doing everything that I was supposed to do. I wanted the AA brass ring. It just didn't seem like it was coming, but I was doing the stuff. And it got better. And then it got worse. The Air Force decided to send me out to Sacramento. So I had to leave her and leave the fellowship that I craved. But I figured, because I've got an ego problem, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm still screwed up. I figured there were people dying by the thousands out in Sacramento, and I had a, I had an answer for them. <laughs> so I was going to come, I'm 11 years sober, hey, I can come out of Reno on this little four-banger Nissan stands I got, and I'm going to save everybody. I'm going to get that picture up on that wall. <laughs> yep. And God, with his sense of humor, broke that four-banger Nissan stands in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Transmission fell out of that suck. I found three things in Cheyenne, Wyoming. I found a, a La Quinta Inn, a Midas uh, Amco station for the, for the car, and right down the end of Main Street and next to the Pizza Hut is there an Alno Club. And I found a meeting of alcoholics. Now I was walked in there. There was a guy named Jim. It's always a guy named Jim. <laughs> got the desk. Got the gavel. Got them little, little big orange little ashtrays that we have, and you know. And they pictured them two old white guys. They were in there, you know. And I stayed there for a couple of days and went to Sacramento during one of its worst rainy seasons. I was a weather forecaster in the military. That was kind of ironic. You know, so, and I met some people. My sponsor gave me three numbers in Sacramento of people that were active in AA. You would have thought that with 11 years of sobriety, what I would have done was the minute I got on station was to make the phone calls and lock in and get hooked up. But fear kicked in. And I don't care how long you've been sober, whether you've been sober a minute or a year or 10 years or 15 years or whatever. When fear kicks in, I, you stop. You stop. Things stop when fear kicks in. And it's courage and it's faith that makes us take the step after the fear kicks in. You know, and I wasn't doing it. And my God has a sense of humor. He put somebody on the phone I had met at some meeting to decide he was going to commit suicide and he wanted to call to say goodbye. <laughs> And because I was taught that we carried his message, I convinced him not to kill himself, which I don't think he was going to really do, but I had to take him to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. And gradually, I got in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous again. There was an old guy there with a steel blue eyes, been sober a lot of years, was in the Navy. 
Uh, ben would drive me around uh, Sacramento. I don't know if you're familiar with Sacramento, but Sacramento is, there's arteries of, of the interstate all through Sacramento. He would stay off every major artery to get us to meetings. So I got to learn a lot about Sacramento back roads. But he would take me to meetings, and he would introduce me to other folks. And Ben was always the guy that kind of introduced me to the Sacramento AA. And he got me, helped me to get back in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. I got a home group out there, and I got active. They used to have this monthly speaker meeting. I would go down that speaker meeting. I'd vacuum that floor. I wouldn't vacuum the apartment I had, but I'd vacuum the floor of that damn meeting. You know, and, and I would do the things that were necessary for me to do to carry the message. After a while, they asked me to greet the people that would, would, would come in to get their birthday. So I was the traffic cop that would shake their hand and then bring them up to the podium. And, and I got involved. I met a lot of folks, and I started talking to people. And gradually what happened is I kept that relationship going with my sponsor. I would call him periodically and he would do nasty mean ego destructing things to me. hang up the phone and i would go i paid for that <laughs> i just paid for that why am i doing this well because it was effective because the thing was when he would do that i would go to the meeting the next day and people might just decide to try to blow smoke up my behind about how wonderful i was and i knew the truth about me so I've been armed with the facts about myself as a result of doing the inventory work, as a result of sharing this stuff and trying to be the best person that I can be in Alcoholics Anonymous. And when you try to tell me stuff to the contrary, I don't have to buy it because the fear is gone. The fear about whether or not I measure up or whether or not I fit in is gone. I've had to do the work to be comfortable here. And I am. And that's what was happening in Sacramento. But, of course, the Air Force had another sense of humor. They decided they want to send me to Korea. Yeah, I didn't want to go to Korea, but when they write the checks, you kind of go where they send you, you know. And so I decided I was going to marry her, leave her, and then go to Korea. Now, I decided to go back to Omaha. I was going to spend my last few years in Omaha. The assignment came. We got married. Now, I loved, I, we had an AA wedding, an AA wedding, because it took, what, the wedding itself only took maybe 15, 20 minutes. Saying hello to goodbye to everybody took about an hour, hour and a half, because we had an AA al -Anon wedding. It was wonderful. Because, I mean, the, my family is very small. Roxanne's family, my wife is very small. You can look at us and tell we, neither one of us look like Donna Reed. Um, but many of the people that we're in the family of Alcoholics Anonymous with are. So our families uh, took up like two rows in the church, and they're looking back, and they're seeing hundreds of white folks. And who are all these people? <laughs> Y'all know, are they here for this wedding or what? <laughs> Whenever something happens in AA, you get all kinds of family members showing up at the hospital. White, blue, black, terrible, you know, short, tall, oriental, you know. Yeah, he's my cousin, you know. <laughs> and, you know usually when people leave the hospital, they say things like, you have a very large family. <laughs> very diverse, you know. <laughs> because that's the way we are in the fellowship. We show up. And they did. They showed up. Even though there was, you know, things going on, I ended up getting that assignment canceled. I had to go back to California, finish up my career in the service. You know, and it was tough. We did this thing long distance. But there's a fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous that we, you've heard about. You heard Susan talk about it. You heard Don talk about it. That when you step in the middle of this thing, it sucks you in. And when you get involved, what happens is you start sharing your life with other people. And they start sharing their life with you and you get interconnected and it gets messy. It gets messy because you don't know where your stuff begins and their stuff ends. And you end up sharing about stuff you never would have done with anybody else before. Now it's just coming out of your mouth matter of fact and it's out in the open now and now everybody knows about it and they already laughed at you and it ain't no big deal. And you get to breathe easy. And you get to wait for the person to walk in the door that is, that is just as screwed up as you were maybe two weeks or two weeks or two days or two minutes ago and you get to help them. And that's what I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous. No matter where I am, I can be of service. Because in Sacramento, they had a lot of things going wrong with their, the fellowship in, in general, in service. And they asked me to, to, to participate. And they said, would you like to be an intergroup? No, I wouldn't like to be an intergroup. But my mind would say that, but my mouth would say, sure, I would be, I'd love to be an intergroup. You know, and I would do it, and I'd do it, and it drove me crazy. And I'd call him, and he'd tell me something, read the book, click, you know, and I was like, ah, you know. <laughs> I want a solution. I want to know how to fix them, you know, and love them. That's how you fix them, you know, love them. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous has been trying to teach me all this time, is that if I love them, they'll get fixed whenever he decides they need to be fixed. All I got to do is learn how to love them. Love is the best thing we got going here. Really, truly is. 
you know, I love this woman, and I got back out of the service, and I came back to Omaha, Nebraska, and I, she had a 14-year-old son, and I had to learn how to love that family, and I had a 28, 22-year-old daughter who cranked out four more, four, uh, my, not my daughter, but her daughter, cranked out four kids, and I have four grandchildren, and the house is insane, he's got rap music going, and he got these grandchildren, and then I'm, I'm getting a new job, and, uh, you know, because it's life. Now, I don't know how to live life well. I had to call my sponsor, and my sponsor made suggestions to me. And those suggestions were basically, well, do the best you can. You know, I mean, do you love her? Yes. Do you love them? Yes. Well, do loving things. Now, what kind of stuff is that? <laughs> do loving things. So I would send notes, and I'd talk to, I'd talk to them, and I listened. He said, treat them like a newcomer. Now, what kind of stuff? Treat them like a newcomer because I've forgotten. In Alcoholics Anonymous, I try to be the best I can be when a new person walks in the door. And if I can do that in a meeting for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, maybe three, I can do that at home. So I had to learn how to sponsor without actually sponsoring my kids, my grandkids and all of them. And, and I started to see them for who they were. And then it was easier for me to love them because now I saw they just screwed up Zion. And I'm a member of fellowship because my first fellowship, the very first fellowship I was a member of was my family was my family. They were the ones that loved me unconditionally first. And they were the ones that caught all the hell. And if I'm about being a principal member of Alcoholics Anonymous, if I'm about being a real man, then what I'm supposed to be doing is concentrating my efforts right there. I'm supposed to take what you give me and spread it all over everybody else. Because I'm one of those kind of alcoholics. I affected at least seven other people when I was drinking. I should be affecting at least that many people with my sobriety. And it's hard because the earth people don't care. My boss does not care that I'm 23 years sober. When Monday morning rolls around, my butt better be there at 8. Now, I better have some business to bring to the table because he's not going to worry. He, I, he doesn't care that I was a spiritual icon Saturday morning. <laughs> don't mean nothing to him. Life on life's terms is what it's all about. And I bought into this, see, because I've been given so much. I've been given a family, and I've been given. That relationship with that little girl has continued and was continued because when she graduated from grammar school, I was there. When she graduated from high school, I was there. When she graduated from college, I was there because I needed to be there, and that was a responsible thing to do. She graduated um, from high school with a National Merit Scholarship, uh, and she lived in D.C., and Eleanor Holmes Norton, the district uh, representative of D.C., gave the address, and Marion Barry, the mayor at that time, put the National Merit Scholarship around my daughter's neck. And she was a valedictorian, and she got a chance to say you know, a few words, five minutes, five, three, five minutes, something like that. And, and from, that, from the stage, watching my daughter graduate with that thing around her neck and all those people listening, she thanked her father for his kindness and his encouragement. Now, I can tell you, I'm not that kind. And any encouragement I ever gave her, I got from you. Because I don't know how to be a dad. At 3 o'clock in the morning, I was convinced many times I was a rotten father. But see, when she graduated from college with, a, with honors in psychology and women's studies, and I don't want to brag, but... Uh, <laughs> She came down those stairs with that little hat on and a little diploma, and she walked up to me, and she put her arms around me, and she said, did I do good, Daddy? You know? Did I do good, Daddy? Now, if I hadn't hung out with you, if I hadn't gone to the meetings, if I hadn't learned how to do the stuff that you told me to do, it didn't make any damn sense. If I hadn't done all those hours in village inns and Denny's, <laughs> if I hadn't sat down and read through the damn bylaws six times to try and figure out what the hell we were supposed to be doing next week, if I hadn't been volunteering to clean up and set up and make stuff and do all that stuff, if I hadn't shown up, if I hadn't sat in here and been ripped apart by the people that have stood up here before me, some of the great ones that have gone on to the big meeting, if I hadn't done any of that stuff, not only would I have not been there, but she wouldn't have even acknowledged my existence because there are many miles separating us. See? I'm close to my daughter, even though there's a lot of miles separating us. And if I can do that, I can do the same thing with you because you're right here. See, I have to remember that I have to do it right now, right here with you. Because love is the greatest thing I have to give. It's the closest thing to divinity we have on the planet. Because it is limitless and it is powerful. 
Love is the thing that brings them here, brings us together. You can have a lot of loves and it never ends for you. You can love your children, you can love your job, you can love your business, you can love your friends, you can love money. You can love all kinds of things, but it never runs out. And it's perfect. And it's messy. Because when you love somebody, you're in it. You're in it with them for the long haul. And I love the people that walk in the doors of alcoholics. And I hate the disease, but I love alcoholics. We are some people, aren't we? We can screw I know a guy that used to say, I can screw up a one cow cattle drive. <laughs> one cow. That's all you got to worry about. One cow. Got to get it from San Diego to San Francisco and can't find it. Because <laughs> start thinking about me. Me, 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 thinking, 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 you know, and that's the deal. I have to learn to put all that stuff aside. I have to learn how to set it aside because it's not important. I haven't had a drink in a long, long time. I haven't heard anything new in Alcoholics Anonymous in a long, 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 long time. But what I do get to see is people walking in the door and they're broken and they're confused. They don't know what they are. They come out of 90 days or 60 days or six months out of a halfway house. They ain't told them they're everything from a duckbill platypus to poly addicted to whatever. They don't know. They have no earthly idea. And all our stuff sitting in a book on 164 pages that we very rarely open. And, you know, and all we got to do is just, hey, it's uh, right here. If you're wondering what you is, this is what we is. <laughs> is you that? <laughs> if you's that, then come with me because I know where we need to go. If you're wondering whether or not you be one of us, well, if I've been talking for a little while, if you've done this, you pretty much one of us. Because only one of us does this when one of us is talking. <laughs> Alan and I do this. <laughs> yeah. I love the both programs. I truly, truly do. I really do. I love both programs because you need a God to live with a drunk. You absolutely need a God to live with a drunk. And God is love as far as I'm concerned. And for me to drink is to die. So if I'm faced with the choices, isn't that funny? Insanity or death or God, and I had to think about it. I had to think about it. I had to give it time. Sometimes I have to, to this day, I have to think about it. Choosing between the pain and the loneliness and the sadness and the hurt and all of that stuff. And God, where we can sit out here in the hot sun and smile and have fun and have snacks and perform for one another and do all kinds of stuff. I got to choose between those two things and it takes me a while. That's crazy, but that's who I am. I'm an alcoholic. And if it wasn't for you giving me the unconditional love when I walked in the door, if it wasn't for you taking those actions that I saw when I didn't believe all the time what you were saying, I would never know that I had the choice because I came here helpless and hopeless. What we give for free here is plenty of hope and a lot of love. And we should not do anything in our meetings to ever change that. You know, whether we have a raffle, whether we do the raffle in the beginning or end, whether we have a 10-minute speaker or a 20-minute speaker, is not important. What is important is when somebody walks in the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous, we never forget that what we're supposed to be telling them is that they don't have to be the way they are right now anymore. Ever. If they do what we do. Just give it a try. It's not perfect. Our love for you is, and God, lo the, the love that God has for us is, but what we do ain't perfect, but it's working. It's the best thing out there right now. So if you're new in Alcoholics Anonymous, stick around. Watch what some of these weirdos do this weekend. <laughs> you know, and then if, if they seem to be happy on Sunday, try it yourself. It might just give you the same effect. You know, and that's what it's all about is we carry this message. You know, I don't have to fix anybody in here. All I got to do is be willing to see what God has in store for me the rest of today and the rest of my life. And he's put all kinds of family members around me, and he's put the fellowship around me. He's put some weird guys that I sponsor around me. They're really crazy men. They see something in me. I think it's probably the same insanity. I really, I'm pretty <laughs> sure. But, you know, and, and all I have to do is just enjoy because I've got all the answers and the solutions in, in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous in the, the experience, strength, and hope of my sponsorship family, the fellowship, you know, and, and my own experience myself. I mean, I've been around here a couple of days, you know, and I've got a lot to offer. But because I have a lot to offer, there's a lot I got to do. There's a lot I got to do to be comfortable in here. And if I'm not willing to do it, I lose it. 
I lose it. I don't want to lose it. I like it. I like it. I defy anybody to try this thing and, and not not get hooked on it. You know, I mean, really, it's a it's a fun deal. I will close with a with a little story that kind of defines who I am, how Alcoholics Anonymous has changed my life, and how things, man, how 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 things are so wonderful that people sit out in the hot sun to listen to me. Man, um, a guy was trying to paint his house, and uh, he had a two-year-old helping him. And two-year-olds are no hep. <laughs> Not by a long shot are two-year-olds any hep at all. Love them, but they're no hep. Uh, so he had, saw a magazine, and, the, and on the magazine was a picture of all of the, well, it was a, a rendition of all of the continents, you know, all the oceans and the African continent, the North American continent, South American continents. And he tore it all apart, and he said, honey, go in the next room and put this puzzle together, thinking that it would keep her occupied for several hours and hopefully get some stuff done. Five minutes went by, and the child came scampering back out. I'm finished. And he went, now, how could you have gotten that done so quickly? I, there are some places on there I'm not sure where they would have gone, you know. Um, what? How did you do it? And the little girl just said, well, there was a man on the other side. You put the man together, the world comes together. You know, and that's what Alcoholics Anonymous has done for me. I came in here with a lot of old ideas, a lot of problems with life on life's terms, and a lot of difficulties, a lot of inabilities to love the people that I cared most about. And, and you said, yo, those are big problems, Sterling, but let's put those aside for a minute. Why don't we just first start on trying to stay one day at a time away from the stuff that's killing you. And let's try to give you some principles, some things that will put you in contact with a higher power that loves you. Give you a place where you can talk about this stuff and you can get to see people succeed and fail at this same struggle that you're suffering from. And armed with all of that, then let's see if we can go back out and tackle those world's problems. And what has happened so far is that I've been relatively successful and that it's been a pretty good journey. It's had its pitfalls, but it's not bad. It really isn't, you know, because y'all helped me put this man together and my world has come together. I defy anybody to find a place that's that effective. I'm grateful to be here and sober. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.